Tokyo Electric Power Company officials say emergency venting procedures may have failed to activate at one nuclear reactor following the March 2011 disaster. The utility has been investigating the Fukushima Daiichi plant to prepare for its decommissioning. Engineers say they did not find high levels of radiation in piping connected to a device called a rupture disc. Water vapor and radioactive materials should have passed through the disc during venting. TEPCO officials say they will continue to investigate how the radioactive release occurred at the number two reactor. We will continue on-site investigations and simulation analysis. We will also analyze the details of the situation after the accident. Crews attempted to vent the containment vessel to release water vapor and radioactive materials. Pressure inside the vessel did not drop in four days after the accident. The reactor was damaged. Investigators believe this caused the release of a massive amount of radioactive materials. They say this is why most plant workers were forced to temporarily evacuate. A nuclear power plant in western Japan is a step closer to going back online. Regulators say safety measures for a reactor at the facility meets the government's new requirements. The plant is the third in Japan to clear this hurdle. Officials at the Nuclear Regulation Authority have been taking a look at the Ikata plant in Ehime Prefecture. They unanimously approved a draft assessment for the number three reactor. And they say the facility meets regulations introduced after the crisis at Fukushima Daiichi four years ago. All of Japan's nuclear reactors are currently offline. Now, officials say the operator of the Ikata plant has taken measures to ensure it can withstand earthquakes and other emergencies. And they say Shikoku Electric Power Company has effective plans to play in place to prevent meltdowns and severe accidents. We had intense discussions that led to this draft assessment. We will continue to proceed with our evaluation of the reactor. Regulators haven't formally approved the assessment yet. They will first solicit comments from the public for a period of 30 days. And officials at Shikoku Electric still need to get approval on equipment design and pass a series of inspections. Municipal leaders must also give their consent, and that means a restart is unlikely before the end of December. The weaker yen and the prospect of rising land prices are making the Japanese property market more attractive to foreign companies. Real estate firms here see that as a promising source of investment. Developers, government officials and others are holding an event in Tokyo to attract overseas buyers. Organizers say it's the first such event ever held in Japan. They say that construction projects in the lead-up to the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics are making foreign firms more interested in purchasing property. One major developer has a display showing his plan to build four complexes around one of Tokyo's busiest train stations. It is important to make PR efforts to the world. If some investors are interested in our business, we want to talk to them as partners. Overseas firms say they're becoming more bullish on the Japanese property market. What's uh, happening in economics, the whole macroeconomic environment, we should see that uh, you know, real estate should be a uh, beneficiary of, of, of what's happening. So we should see that there will be a lot more um, international interest in Japan, real estate. Officials at a private research institute say foreign purchases of real estate were worth nearly $10 billion in the business year that ended in March that's a record high. And people working to decontaminate communities near Fukushima Daiichi have reached a milestone. They've started to clean up the last of 11 municipalities to undergo decontamination. The work in the town of Taba will cover about 4% of the community. That's about 200 hectares where radioactive levels are relatively low. It includes residential areas and farmland. The work has been delayed as negotiations continued over how to rebuild the town. Contractors have begun to cut grass and remove dirt from ditches. The work in the other 10 municipalities has ended or is underway. The cleanup in Futaba is scheduled to be completed by next March. We hope to move forward in the next step for reconstruction by finishing the decontamination work as soon as possible. 
96% of Taba is still designated as a no-entry zone. Town officials are asking for that part to be decontaminated as well, but no decision has been made yet. Living in Japan's countryside have seen their communities wither and economic opportunities dry up. Now the residents of one village are rethinking the way they use a natural resource to harvest a brighter future. The mountain village of Nishi Awakura in Okayama Prefecture is surrounded by forest. About 1,500 people live there. Timber harvesting once provided most of the village's income, but local foresters could not compete with cheap materials from overseas. Daisuke Maki is a forestry consultant. Village leaders asked him to help revitalize the local industry. Six years ago, he founded a company in partnership with the village. It makes use of resources that once had little or no value. This floor and desks are made from small cedars and cypresses thinned from the forest. The company processes the wood into value-added products and sells them over the Internet. Yukahari tile is one of the company's most popular offerings. It's flooring made of 100% wood. A rubber pad on the bottom holds it firmly in place, so there's no need for nails. It's thicker and retains heat better than other types of flooring. Since 2011, sales have grown to 60,000 tiles and more than $800,000 a year. Our vision of generating economic activity from our woodlands is finally starting to take shape. Maki's approach integrates activities ranging from forest management to sales. Local officials organize the owners of individual parcels of forest land. Maki also asks people outside the community to invest in harvesting machines and other equipment. He raised nearly $400,000. The new system transforms what was once low-value scrap into high-value products, which are then sold directly to consumers. And money that once left the community is now recirculating within it. Eleven new businesses have been launched. Together, they've created 120 new jobs and generate about $6 million in annual sales. The effects are spilling over into other parts of the local economy as well. Hotels that had gone out of business have reopened. About 60 people have moved here in recent years. New kinds of industries are being born and the village's economy is getting stronger. This village hot spring also benefits from the new system. In February, the operator switched from a kerosene-powered boiler to one that runs on firewood. Daisuke Izutsu is the supplier. He sells the business wood that cannot be used to make furniture. He delivers it four times a day. The new boiler is good for the environment as well as the economy. Wood ash is used to enrich the soil in local farm fields. The operator of the hot spring estimates that the switch to firewood will save more than $40,000 a year. They used to heat the water using kerosene, but that just transfers money outside the village. By using wood, they've reduced costs, and the money stays here. With help from the village, Izutsu plans to broaden the customer base for his business to include hotels and homes. The unique direction taken by the residents of this village could help provide communities throughout Japan with a path through the economic wilderness. Association representing zoos and aquariums in Japan have voted for change. They say they'll no longer purchase dolphins caught in drive hunts. They were facing expulsion from the international body who called the practice unethical. The majority of member facilities voted to remain part of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. 
The loss of membership would mean Japan would lose access to animals from overseas and participation in breeding programs. Many of the dolphins in Japanese aquariums were captured through drive fishing off the town of Taiji in western Japan. Conservation groups have long criticized the hunt, and the Oscar-winning U.S. documentary The Cove prompted global scorn in 2009. The association says it will make further efforts to breed dolphins, but some aquariums are raising concern. Facilities across Japan have been trying to improve their breeding technology for more than half a century. Only a limited number have reported success. Dolphin breeding does not only concern aquariums. The association as a whole should work on it. And involvement of research institutes, including universities, is also necessary. Experts say the government must also support the breeding pro pro program. Weekend, Easter holidays and cherry blossom viewing tours brought a record number of people to Japan last month. <laughs> Officials at a national tourism organization have released preliminary data showing that just over 1.76 million foreigners visited in April. That's up more than 43 percent from a year earlier. It's the highest number of travelers for a single month since officials began collecting data in 1964. People from mainland China made up the largest share at just over 400,000. That's up more than 110 percent from April 2014. Visitors from Taiwan rose almost 30 percent to 335,000. The figures for China and Taiwan are all-time highs for a single month. Travelers from South Korea totaled more than 300,000, up 57 percent. And people from Thailand, Hong Kong and the United States also came to Japan in record numbers. Tourism officials predict the trend will continue. More flights are connecting Japanese regional cities and foreign countries, particularly in Asia. They say lower fuel surcharges will lead to more people visiting Japan. A nuclear disarmament conference at UN headquarters in New York have headed into the final stretch. But the talks are deadlocked and the conference president has urged negotiators to compromise. I do need an extra effort for this final phase of the work of the conference. Then please keep your mind open, constructive, in order that we can achieve this common goal. The month-long conference reviewing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty ends Friday. Delegates are discussing disarmament, non-proliferation, and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Negotiations on disarmament have been particularly difficult. Nuclear powers are calling for arms reduction in phases, while countries without nuclear missiles are demanding a ban on such weapons. And Japanese officials want the treaty to include an invitation to world leaders to visit the atomic bomb cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But delegates from China are against North the Korean idea. officials say they're developing submarine-launched ballistic missiles to boost the country's self-defense capability. And they're warning Japan, the United States, and South Korea that they're always ready to strike. The state-run Korean Central News Agency on Wednesday quoted a spokesperson for the North's National Defense Commission. A report released on May 9th said the country had successfully test-fired a ballistic missile from a submarine at sea. The latest statement says the North's development of nuclear weapons had entered a new phase of miniaturization and diversity. It says the country's short, medium and long-range rockets are all capable of hitting targets with a high degree of accuracy. South Korea's defense minister says the North's submarine-based ballistic missiles will be ready for use as weapons in four to More five than years. 100 volumes of a register containing the names of victims of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima have been taken out of storage and aired. The ritual is carried out every year before the rainy season. A group of 16 officials from Hiroshima City offered a silent prayer in front of a cenotaph at 8.15 Wednesday morning. That's the exact time the bomb was dropped on August 6, 1945. The officials then removed the register from storage. 106 of the books contained the names of 292,325 Hibaksha, or atomic bomb victims, who had died by August 5th of last year. Another book contains the names of nine people who died in the atomic bombing of Nagasaki on August 9th, 
1945. Relatives of those victims wanted them included on the Hiroshima list. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the bombing, so we carried out this annual airing with determination. The annual work of adding the names of those who died on or after August 6th of last year, as well as newly identified victims, will begin in mid-June. The list will be placed back in storage during the peace memorial ceremony on the anniversary.